watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. Facebook Live. Hope you're doing well. You guys in here at 10 a.m., how are we doing? We're doing well. Lively. I like it. You had your coffee. You got in. Hopefully you didn't hit like a backhoe on the way in. Lots of construction going on. We're excited for that in the family ministries facility. And uh, speaking of family, I remember walking through the other day in the thrift store, and there was, how many of you guys remember a day where you had one of these kind of phones in your house? Yeah, Uh, some of you even remember, like I do, where you had to dial, and like they had the rotary where you would do it, and you would forget, and you're like, "Ah!" and you'd have to put the phone down and re, you know, pick it back up and redo it. Um, we were walking through the thrift store not too long ago, and I was with our four-year-old, and she's like, Daddy, what's, what's that? And so, like, all she's ever known in a phone is this. And so I'm like, baby, this is a phone. And she's like, where's the flat part? She's thinking like this. You put it up, and you look, you FaceTime. And I'm like, well, it doesn't. She's like, where's the screen? And I'm like, well, you had to pick it up. And when you start to explain a phone like this to someone who's never seen one, it sounds like you're 1,000 years old. Like, back when I rolled the dinosaurs in, we had these things called phones. And so, like, I'm explaining to her, I'm like, we had to pick this part up and hold it at your ear, and then you would punch in the keys. She's like, why wouldn't they just put it? Why does it have so many pieces? I was like, technology. Like, it just kind of, you know, we had to do it. And then you couldn't, like, run around with it. You had to plug it into the wall. She's like, so you can't watch YouTube in the car? Like, she's trying to process all this, and she she was not having it. And, and we had these in our homes. How many of you still have, by show of hands, still have a, like, so, so a couple people? So I mean, we have one in our house because we have somebody who is a... Uh, further along in their years, or seasoned, if you will, that lives with us, and we're not going to try to teach them like all this stuff with someone, so we have a phone like that still at the house, and but for most of us, for the vast majority of you guys online, this is non-existent. Part of it was out of necessity, because you're like, wait a second, it, it, times are hard, and if I'm going to pay for this and all of that, I'm not paying for another line. That's crazy talk. And so we get rid of them. And there was a time when this was a staple in people's homes, and we would, and when it rang, people, there was, imagine this, there was a time when the phone rang, and we were excited. Like, it rang, now like it rang, we're like, ignore, like, oh, it's just mom, ignore, like, whatever, no, just kidding if mom's listening, um, like, you do that, but it would ring, and we would run across the house, and we'd get to the phone, and we're like, hello, and be like, could I speak to Mr. and Mrs. Oh, oh, mom, you know, we do, you cup the, mom, dad, it's for you, and then we wouldn't wait, we'd just be like, throw it down, and run off, they would hear all the conversation in the background as it was going on, but now with our joys, our sorrows, everything, when an emergency happened, immediately pick up the phone. Everything was to run to this. And then we took them out of our houses. We got rid of them. You know, it's interesting that we moved to devices that were supposed to help us be more connected. And while we have, may have more digital connections, we have less of a connection than ever before to people. And I think it's fascinating that along that time that that began happening, On a spiritual level, we began having less and less as a culture of a connection with God. 
the moments that we started to get rid of the things that connected us so we could know better and somehow be more connected, we became less connected than ever before. You see, for the human nature, we have a tendency to want to get rid of things because we know better. You see, the connection we need is the very connection we have a propensity to remove. That connection with God, because for many of us, I would venture to say most, if not all of us watching online in here, that we want to do things on our own. Yeah, I know it. I'm a big boy. I'm a big girl. I'm a grown man. I can do stuff on my own. Yeah, right. I don't need any help with in, fill in the blank. We have a tendency to think that we know better than God. And so the wind and the waves hit, the chaos hits. Loss happens, difficulty happens. Let's face it, we live in a broken world. We're watching this even last night. You turn on the news and you're like, all right, mass shooting in Texas, Amazon is on fire. We're watching like riots in the streets in China. Like we're seeing things happen. That's just the tip of the iceberg of things that we're watching all around the world. Man, the world seems pretty fractured. And then you and I have our own personal wind and waves the things that are very difficult to overcome, the things that feel like insurmountable, like we're drowning under the pressure and we just go, I don't know what to do. You see, but we did know at one point we had this connection. We thought it was great. And then we're like, I think I know better. Like I know God's up there, but like I've kind of convinced him of a plan that I think is absolutely amazing. And I'm pretty good at this. And so I'm going to do it. And then the wind and waves hit. And we're like, it's like when, if you've ever watched The Simpsons, the cartoon, and Homer's like, ah! and he like freaks out and he's running around. And then we go and we're like, oh, let me find that cable that was there one time. Let's see if we can fix this up. And we go, wait a second. I can connect it, but it's going to take a lot more work. Can't just tape that together and go, we're good as new. Took, did that one shot at church, we're all right. No, it's going to take a lot of effort. So you're going to have to unplug this. You're going to have to strip this away, strip away the cables, plug everything back in. It's going to take some time. But we think that everything's just going to happen instantly because we live in an instant culture. And so this connection severed and we march on with our new worldview that we can do it on our own and we've got this and everything's fine which is why I'm glad we're doing this. And then next week, we start a brand new series called Intentional Encounters. We're going to take four weeks in the chaos of we get into fall, new routines. We're beginning to go, all right, especially if you have kids. Kids are going back to school. Yes. And so, yeah, all the teachers are like, no, we love you, teachers. Take them. And so, like, we're getting into all the routines and everything's happening. And we go, all right, I need to get re- I need to figure out a way. And part of it, it's almost like that weird kind of New Year's resolution time almost where we go, I'm going to get on track. I'm going to get better. This, this is going to be different. And well, we want to help you in fostering that because we don't want to be people who just go, oh, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And then we're like, the house is burning down. We're like, everything's fine. And, and we don't ask for help, but we can be intentional in how we connect with God. And I love the way that Craig Rochelle puts all this. He's a pastor um, in the Midwest. He says, what do you do when you're in the valley? Well, you remember what God has done. Because we don't turn our backs on God and go, oh, but we, but we do this sometimes mentally. Like, God's great. He's awesome. Everything's fine. I've got a bluebird on my shoulder. And, it's, oh, we're, and, we're, and then all of a sudden, the bottom drops out. And we go, God, where are you? And we get mad. We get angry. We shake our fist at the heavens. What do you do when you're in the valley? What do you do when you're in the wind and waves? You remember what God has done when he comforted you when he guided you, when he answered your prayer exactly the way you wanted him to. Remember those times? Oh, no. We could take for every 10 good things that happen, one bad thing that happens almost unravels it all. So we remember that, oh, my God, I can't believe you didn't answer me exactly the way that I wanted to. And when he didn't do what you wanted, but sometime later you realized it was exactly what you needed. Ever been there before? Where you're like, oh, in the moment, nobody can tell you otherwise. You're like, God's the worst Like you have, you're in, if you're right now, you're like, I can't believe he said, that's how we feel sometimes, isn't it? That I can't believe God, this was great. Now it's not, where are you? But then we get further along. We've, our family's experienced a myriad of things where we just go, man, I wasn't expecting that. And then later on a year, three years, five years, 10 years, sometimes later we go, oh God, you knew exactly how to leverage a thing that you didn't create, but you used it for our good. And you dare to believe that, what he's done before, 
this hope that he will do it again. And so how do we embrace this? Because let's face it, bad things are going to happen. This isn't, and if you've heard it from a church, you went to a church and, you know, a pastor got up and they started talking. They said, if you follow Jesus, everything will be fine and it will be great and it will be amazing and you will never hurt, you'll never have pain, whatever. I want, first of all, run, run immediately because nowhere in the Bible does it say, if you follow Jesus, everything will be amazing. Nowhere. Actually, we're promised multiple times that we will encounter hardship, not if but when. And so there's going to be these moments. And so if you don't hear anything else, my prayer is that you hear this when it comes to the wind and the waves in your life and in mine to get refocused. Moving from the chaos of that to come comes from closeness to the creator. Notice I didn't say moving from chaos to everything's fine. You will have calm, but trust me, it's not going to go away. It's not like you're going to follow Jesus and be like, I don't have any more chaos. Everything's great. Everything's fine. It's all good. Like, you will have moments of that or what Christians call, and Christians say really weird things, okay? And so if you talk to a Christian and, they, and you're like sitting back going, I don't know, Christians say, they, they will say, you know what? You're going through a season. You're just going through a season of life and it's going to get better. Hey, I hate to break it to you, but that season is going to have like reprieve for 10 hours and then you know what happens? Another season. Like, you're going to have stuff that happens. It's like, we don't go, it's, it's like somehow we forget the seasons in like normal. Like, we don't go through summer and go, well, once we get through summer, then we won't have anything else. No, we're going to have fall. And then it's going to keep cycling through. It keeps going. And so as we do this, we go to move from a mentality of the chaos to come comes from closeness. Now, I'm not saying agreement. I'm not saying that you and I are going to be like, me and Jesus, we're the best. Like, there's going to be moments where you're like, r- closeness also has wrestling with it. But you can't wrestle with someone that's far away. If you were standing across the parking lot and I was standing right here, we can't wrestle. That doesn't happen that way. We have to be close. And so if you're wrestling with God this morning in the truths and all these things that happen, good. Because it means that you guys are close together, even if things are difficult. And so how, do we, this, how does this play out? And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1 in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, you can get one in the lobby. For those of you guys online or if you're more digitally inclined, you can go to ForefrontChurch.info, swipe over a couple times, and there's a notes section. It has everything that we're talking about right there for you. And this passage we're going to look at unpacks this, you guys, me, all of us, encounter waves storms, it gets difficult, but we can still hold strong even in the middle of it and be close to the creator. And so this is what it shares starting in verse six. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be here on the screens. So to so be truly glad. Right out of the gate, it's like, cool. Like if someone shows up at your house and like your dog got ran over, your car broke down, house burnt down, like you had experience loss, something difficult happened, and they walk up and the first thing they say is, So be truly glad. Like you're going to, you might punch them. I don't know. Like you may be very upset with them. And so if we just take that at face value, that's why I tell people, don't just simply read a verse and be like, or get discouraged. Read the context of what's happening. If we stop there, we would miss the whole point. There is wonderful joy ahead. And we go, oh, I, I want joy ahead. Sure. Even though you must endure many. If you have a Bible, physical Bible this morning or whatever, highlight, circle, put a bunch of arrows to that, put a frowny face if you want to, endure many trials for a little while. Now, these will come in waves. This won't be something that just comes and it's done. But it continues on, the writer shares. These trials will show that your faith is genuine, that it's not like, and there's a big difference between somebody who goes, I show up to church every once in a while, like every, you know, here and there. And I kind of, you know, I play faith and then it's genuine. And you can tell the difference. And I'm glad whether you're tuning in or you're here, this is your opportunity, you're kind of getting it. But my hope and prayer is that you'll make this consistent because there is a difference in fostering that well over time. It says, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, again, it keeps using that word many. This isn't, and so the Krishna tells you, this is just a season. 
pause and go like, no, God says there's going to be many. Like, and, do, and don't have a defeatist attitude, just be prepared. Like, be prepared for what's happening. This isn't one of those things where you sit back and go, well, now that I've been through that, everything is, no, there's another one. It's like the wave. You've been to the beach. There's waves that happen in sets. You have never been to the beach where the waves 100% stop. And you go, oh, that's weird. Looks like a lake today. Like, they will always come. The tide will always happen. There's always another wave approaching. And so it will bring much praise and glory if you hold strong in honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. And so how can we do this? How can we make it through this? And, and I have two things. It's simple. I'm not here to reinvent the wheel this morning. But Jesus spent a lot of time while he was on earth preaching like the same 10 sermons, same 10 things. And so if you've met somebody, and, and I caution you, they're like, I just really want to go deeper. And I'm like, cool, how are you doing with reading your Bible? Praying and encouraging people and telling them about Jesus. You know, I don't want to talk about that. I just want to have head knowledge. Jesus taught very simple and poignant messages that drew people back to God. It was simple. It wasn't something that everyone was like, but their minds were blown because of how simple it was. And so there are two very simple things that you and I can do as we move towards God and take our next step. And the first one is this. You can make it through the wind and waves when you know the one who controls it. When you and I personally know Jesus. Now, I know like that's super, you're like, whoa, that's like some ethereal Star Wars kind of stuff. Like, how do I know Jesus? Jesus ain't here. Like, Jesus, like everything that I taught is he was a baby, and then like he came, and then that six and eight pounds baby Jesus got grew up, and he's a man, and then he went to this, I think like he like died or something. Like, if you have any background in faith, which is true, like he went to a cross and he died for you and I and rose from the dead and is with the Father until the day when he returns and makes all things new. But here's the big pushback in this. Because you go, cool, that's great. But I have these conversations where people will say, if God's in control of everything, then why doesn't he just stop it all and make it not happen? That's a great question. And if you're a believer and this question terrifies you from somebody who doesn't claim faith, then maybe you need to have a stronger connection to Jesus. Because these kinds of questions shouldn't scare a believer. These kinds of questions shouldn't, if we are connected to God, this shouldn't be like, oh man, like, I just don't know, I'm not sure. Because this is a lens view that is off, that is off kilter, that is off the radar of how someone views God and how someone views the Bible. You see, in this, it, this could be something that's difficult. We could land at this thinking when we view the Bible as good advice instead of the good news. When we first out, if we view the Bible as just good advice, we're like, Meh, God kind of gave us these instructions to help us a little bit, and they're kind of suggestions, and I can take it or I can leave it. It's become more like a golden corral, and I'll take a little bit of this, and oh, I don't really, really like that, and that, oh, that's good. They got that right today, and oh, the chef was really messed up there. Like, we're moved through, and we just grab a la carte what we want instead of saying that this collection, the Bible, a collection of books, is the good news. And the good news means that it is, for you and I, the story of God's pronouncement and fulfillment of a promise that you and I will be set free and all things will be made new. You see, God is in the process of making things new, which is why this shouldn't scare us. He's not a celestial CEO that has just kind of sat back and is a lackluster boss and is looking at the situation going, man, how do I fix this hot mess that's going on? Like, that is not the movement of God. And if we engage God in the Bible, we would see that that's not his nature. God is not an underachiever. He has this project of a new creation that starts with Jesus, that even though sin entered the world, God had a plan. It didn't take God off guard when Adam and Eve in the garden early on, the beginning of recording Bible, when they sinned, God wasn't going, huh, didn't plan on that happening. Like that, God is not taken off guard by things. And when we view the Bible as God kind of going, all right, I guess let's see what he has next. He'll kind of figure this out along the way. We have a poor view of God. It begins with Jesus. He's in the process of making all things new. It's the very prayer of Jesus. It's called the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. God, your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus knew that this was a process. This wasn't something that was just simply happening. I love the way that uh, Pastor N.T. Wright puts it. He says, that's why the good news of Jesus is that in the middle of this confusing world with so much beauty, but also so much sorrow, what God has done in Jesus launches a project. He launches this, which says, yes, the sorrow is real, but God has dealt with it and is dealing with it. The beauty and power of creation are real, and God is going to do a new thing for which there are signposts along the way. We can take the project that's happening out here, for instance. We're going to have a brand new children's facility because you guys apparently like to procreate, and there's a bunch of little humans running around, and we need to make sure we have continued space for them, so we have it there. But they've been clearing dirt and everything for about a week and a half. Nobody in their right mind is going to go out there and go... So I hear this project's going on, and it's been about a week and a half. I don't understand why this 4,000-square-foot facility isn't done yet. You guys need to get it together. Like, no, we would have more patience. Why? Because we know that it's not something that happens immediately. It's a process. It's the same thing when you go out to eat. And the cook's back there, and you go to a fancy restaurant, and you're kind of, you know, you're living it up. And you go, you don't sit down, order, unless you're going to a Mexican restaurant, which I think they already know what you're ordering before you know you're ordering. Because you order, they leave, and you go to take a sip, and it's there. And they're sneaky. It's amazing. But, like, you go to a restaurant, and you wait, and you're taking time. Why? Because you know that it's a process. Why is it that we have more patience for a builder and for a cook than we do with God? that somehow we think that God doesn't have it under control. He made the architect and he made the cook. I think he knows how to fix this. I think he already has a plan. And it's been in motion from the very beginning. And here's the deal. You know who wrecked it? Us. We wrecked it. Then we're mad that God hasn't fixed our mess and our chaos. And God goes, I, I got it. I got it, and it's breaking my heart that these things are happening, but I'm working towards making a new heaven and a new earth. Don't you worry. I have it under control, which is why he says, if you want to connect, what Jesus tells us, if you want to connect with me, if you want to make it through the wind and waves, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your what? Own way. For some of us, that hits us hard, but we don't want to hear that. Give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If I want to make it through the wind and waves, if you want to make it through the chaos of life and experience the calm, even in the middle of all that storm, it starts with following Jesus. And so are you ready to give up your own way, follow Jesus? And I'm I'm just not talking to people who haven't made a decision for God yet. You may be saying, I already made a decision for God, I'm good. That might be part of your problem. I'm good isn't where that needs to stop. I made a decision for Jesus, and I'm in process. I am going to continue on. I am still being made new. Yes, Jesus covered my sin, but I can tell you right now that nobody in this room is perfect at patience. Trust me, I see it every day when I'm driving around Hampton Roads. We need some help, guys. There are plenty of factors that go into this where we are not at the pinnacle of where God desired us to be, and we won't be until Jesus comes back. It's so we are in process. We are trusting God along the way. And so even if you've made a decision for God, are you ready to deny yourself and give up your way for Jesus? If you've never made a decision, are you ready to drop it and follow him? But there's a second piece to this. Not only is it connection with Jesus, with following him, with giving up. And this isn't, and when I say following him and give up your own way to follow Jesus, what I'm not saying is that you have to sell all your stuff tonight, move to Uruguay, and start preaching in a, you know, like, I don't even know what I'm doing, I'm preaching there. He might be. If you, you, if you email me and you're like, actually, I've been praying about Uruguay for years, I'll be like, that's awesome. Like, go there. But that is not what God, and I, we get this confused. We'd be like, I either need to go join a convent or whatever. That is not what God is asking. What he's asking is, do you trust me? That if I say go that way, that you'll go that way, even if you're unsure what that way holds. If it means, maybe it means giving up on the dream that you have because God has a better dream in store when it comes to your occupation, with the house you live in, 
with the dream you have, if you know, you're single and you're like, oh man, I've seen all these people and they have families and they have this and that and mom and dad are pressuring me, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? And I got to live up to that dream. Maybe God has a beautiful dream that involves none of having the family that other people want for you, but joining in what the family of God has desired for you because singleness isn't a curse. But you can move through that and watch what God does in the process. It's trusting him. There's a second piece. You can make it through the wind and waves when you have a support system around you. Almost all of us would say, that sounds like sound, like, you know, you know, I think that direction sounds good. Here's the problem with that. We start digging a little deeper. We peel back the layers. For many of us, we'd be like, oh, well, I don't want you to be up in my business. Like, I just want you to like, you mean support, like just people around that I can be like, hey, and they see my face occasionally, like once every month on church, like, because I can tell them like, still love Jesus. All right, I'm going to go do my thing. Like we connect in that way. Uh Uh-uh. See, here's the pushback on that that I, I had recently with someone. But I already have that. I got my coworkers. I tell them what's going on and they commiserate with me and we're good. I go on Facebook and everybody on my friends list agrees with my hurt. Of course they do. No one hops on there when you're like, oh, I hate everything and everything's going away. They, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, we love you. You don't have a friend jumping in there going, hey, you need to suck it up. Put up your big girl pants and get with it. Like nobody's saying that, okay? Because then they're just like, unfriend, why? Because we don't like it when people speak things into our lives that might actually be true. We just really like to have people that are yes men and yes women. And so, but what if I already have that? Then the next week, you don't know what I need. Maybe someone said, you don't know what I need. I know what I need. I'm me. You're not me. I know what I need. But then you can take that if you dig a little deeper, a step further. Well, well, also, if God knows what I need, he's already given it to me, right? Sure. But just because God has given something to you does not mean that you've actually utilized it. God could have put a really great friend in your life that you were like, stop, hard pass. They tried to open up and help you in your life. You're like, yeah, I'm going to have a little bit of, I don't know, none of that. <laughs> and then you go, oh, I have people in my life. I have coworkers, I have Facebook, I have Instagram, I have people, I have enough people that I can go to. And the signpost that you could see on whether or not that's really happening would look much like this. The half-brother of Jesus and other writers of the New Testament confess your sins to each other and pray for one another. It's very rare that we see that happening on Facebook land. Encra- this one, encourage each other and build each other up. No, that's not really happening. You see, and I would ask the question, who are you regularly in accountability with? The way we say it this way, and people get annoyed with me saying it, but now everybody knows it because repetition is key, that people that love God and love you, but what? Love God more than you. So they can celebrate with you when life's awesome, but they can also say, hey, I love you, but can I say something? You go, yeah, that was really not okay. Let's talk about it. And this person regularly accountability with, is not, if you're married, if you're dating, whatever, is not your spouse, is not your boyfriend, is not your girlfriend. Now, you may have that with them, but you will have days. Trust me, been married now this September, will be 15 years. You will have days where you want to get through the conversation. And so you're just going to say whatever they want to say and vice versa. Because you're like, I'm just trying to go to bed, whatever you need to hear. Like you do. And it's not being mean, it's just the reality. Do you have somebody, and don't nudge them now if they're sitting next to you. I'll be like, see? Like, but there will be moments where you need someone, you saw the small groups video, that can speak truth into your life because they love you. Truth does not negate love. Truth only amplifies love. And so as we do this, it needs to be somebody. I have three guys in my life who I fill out a basic questionnaire before we meet up, either FaceTime or on the phone, fill out all the stuff. One of the last questions on each of the things is, did you lie to me during any point in this thing? I wanted to because I'm messed up. I make mistakes. But it's not my wife that I'm answering. I do answer for those things for her because we're married and we care about one another. But I need people in my life who care about me and can set me straight. And I would caution you with this. If you're going to somebody who's speaking into your life for accountability, look at them and ask them, who do you have that's holding you accountable? And if they can't name anybody, they're no longer your accountability person because you don't earn the right to speak into someone's life unless you have someone speaking into your life. 
And that may upset you. Be like, I didn't date in. No. Because if no one's keeping you in check, you don't have the right to speak into someone else. Because then you are living in an island. And when the wind and waves hit you, who are you going to? You see, this is a process that's so necessary. Because if you and I want to move from chaos to calm, that comes from closeness to the Creator. Closeness to other people, connecting in this, and making faith in God the biggest priority. And you will survive. It will not be easy, and you will have more seasons of wind and waves and stuff, but God is still God, and God is still good. And he will help you navigate it and have a sense of calm even in the middle of a storm. Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.